a, a lecture. It's not, you know, sitting there and being talked to. It's a very personal, hands-on experience. And I'm going to lead you through prayer practices and give you, hopefully, a let them get the experience, you know, uh, relating to God in probably a very much different way than what they're used to. But it's just really to open the door um, to new experiences, to new ways to experience God other than just ways they, you know, are used to. Well, good morning, Caldwell Methodist. How's everyone? Uh, that on the uh, the TVs was our uh, my or Don and I's good friend uh, Susan Sanders, who will be here June the twenty fourth for the uh, women's retreat. Um, if you're signed up for the retreat, raise your hand. If you're not signed up for the retreat, you need to. It's twelve dollars, and like I said before, if you can't afford it, I'll I'll pay for the twelve dollars. You deserve this retreat. Uh, take this time for yourself. It's, it's on Saturday, the 24th of June, and it's from 1130 till about 5. And, uh, and it's an opportunity for you to, to learn new ways to experience God through prayer practices. Um, also coming up on June the 17th, which is next Saturday. Is it doing it again? I didn't do anything to it. All right. Well, next Saturday, the Gulf Coast Regional Blood Center is set fellowship hall so that uh, uh, they can take your blood. They need your blood. I, I, uh, I, I donate frequently. Uh, it saves lives. I actually have a, a blood type that, that is used for uh, burn victims a lot. So, so if you have, have a, a sign-up sheet in the fellowship hall, and grab the mic. He's telling me, grab the mic. It was working fine in the first service. It's, it's really needed, and it's a great blessing to be able to do that. Also, uh, on June, uh, July 9th, uh, we're going to have the uh, lunch in between the two services, so there will not be uh, Sunday school that day. It will be the Father's Day luncheon. Uh, if you're interested in uh, serving at UM Army, if you're a youth or an adult, uh, that is July the 9th through the 15th. We still have a couple of seats available, so if you're interested in doing that, come join us for that. Um, also, VBS is around the corner. It's a little over a month away. And anybody who has ever uh, been involved in VBS knows that it takes an army to put that on. We need lots of volunteers. Maybe you can't volunteer during that week, but maybe you can help volunteer helping to set up uh, as, the, as we get ready for that. Maybe you can help with registrations or whatever it is. Any way that you feel that God's leading you to help, be sure to either come see me after this or contact the office so that we can get you involved in being in, uh, uh, involved in VBS. That'll be July the 25th through the 27th. And, and with that, uh, let us stand and uh, uh, spend 30 seconds greeting our neighbors in the peace of Christ. Testing, testing one, two, one, two. We'll try it. Let's see. Good morning, and <laughs> good morning. Let's make some noise. Jesus, oh, for grace to trust him more. 
It's not up there. That's right. We'll grab a Bible. Psalm 33, verses 1 through 5. It's testing my ability to search the scriptures. Rejoice in the Lord, O you righteous. Praise befits the upright. Praise the Lord with the lyre. Make a melody to him with the harp of ten strings. Sing to him a new song. Play skillfully on the strings with loud shouts. For the word of the Lord is upright, and his work is done in faithfulness. He loves righteousness and justice. The earth is full of of steadfast love of the Lord. This is the word of God for us, the people of God. Amen. Jesus draws
Let's all join together in prayer. Almighty and tender Lord Jesus Christ, just as I have asked you to love my friends, so I ask the same for my enemies. You alone, Lord, are mighty. You alone are merciful. Whatever you make me desire for my enemies, give it to them and give the same back to me. Have I ever asked them for anything which is outside your perfect rule of love, whether through ignorance, weakness, or malice? Good Lord, do not give it to them and do not give it back to me. You who are the true light, lighten their darkness. You who are the whole truth, correct their errors. You who are the incarnate word, give life to their souls. Tender Lord Jesus, let me not be a stumbling block to them, nor a rock of offense. My sin is sufficient to me without harming others. I, as a slave to sin, beg your mercy on my fellow slaves. Let them be reconciled with you, and through you, reconciled to me. Thank you, Lord. Those who are assisting with the offering, will you please come forward? Let us pray. Heavenly Father, we ask that you bless these, your tithes and our offerings. Let them build your kingdom here on earth. 
Let it be a means of showing people your glory, your grace. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Good morning. Do I have little friends who want to come visit with me today? I have prices for you. Okay, okay, so what do I have here? What does this say, Kaysen? First aid kit, okay? Y'all wanna play with the first aid kit? I bet your mom and dad, they don't let you play with theirs, huh? So let's play with it. Okay, so y'all have some bandages. Did either of y'all need a bandage? Did you have Bobo's where I put your bandage? No, I did. you didn't have Bobo's, did you? Well, so our Bible lesson today is about a guy named Matthew. He was a tax collector, and he wasn't a very good guy. First of all, nobody likes to pay taxes. The same is true in 2023 as it was whenever Jesus was, was here with us. And um, so nobody likes to pay taxes, number one. And second of all, the tax collectors back in Jesus' day, they were, they were extra bad guys because they like stole more money from people than they really had to. So nobody liked tax collectors. And that's what Matthew was. So Jesus came to town and he saw Matthew and he said, hey, you come follow me. And Matthew did. And so later that evening, Matthew was having dinner with Jesus in his house. So um, Matthew invited all of, over some friends, and there were a lot of other tax collectors that came. There were a lot of sinners that came, a lot of probably not the, the kind of people that your parents would let you hang around too much, right? And so um, the Pharisees, you know, they're the judgy guys in the Bible. They pulled Jesus' disciples aside, and they said, hey, why does your teacher eat with tax collectors and sinners? And Jesus heard what those Pharisees asked, and he said, it is not the healthy who need a doctor, it's the sick. And he said that he did not come for the righteous people, but he came for the sinners. Now, can you tell me, do either of y'all have, have you ever committed a sin before? I certainly have. I've definitely sinned, for sure, right? And so, guess what? That means that Jesus came for us, right? I've got some prizes for you since we've got a medical theme going on. I have some pills, but not really. They're just Tic Tacs. So, what I want you to think of whenever you eat your Tic Tacs is two things, okay? Number one, Jesus loves you. And number two, Jesus came to save you. Okay, let's pray. God, thank you for loving us. Thank you for healing us. Thank you for sending a Savior because we need you, Jesus. Please help us to show your love to others. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Our scripture reading is from Matthew 9, 9 through 13. 
As Jesus went on from there, he saw a man named Matthew sitting at the tax collector's booth. Follow me, he told him, and Matthew got up and followed him. While Jesus was having dinner at Matthew's house, many tax collectors and sinners came and ate with him and his disciples. When the Pharisees saw this, they asked his disciples, why does your teacher eat with tax collectors and sinners? On hearing this, Jesus said, it is not the healthy who need a doctor, but the sick. But go and learn what this means. I desire mercy, not sacrifice. For I have not come to call the righteous, but sinners. Thank you, Amy. I brought it just in case. In the summer of 1971, it's a few years ago, uh, psychology professor, no, nope, it's not going to do it. All right, we're switching. It was working fine in the first service, but I, I don't know, I broke something, I guess. A psychology professor in the 1971 call, uh, named uh, Professor Philip Zimbardo of Stanford University began a study on human behavior in the prison systems. His goal of this study was to discern the psychological effects of becoming a prisoner or a prison guard. Uh, now, after doing some uh, research, he deemed that it was unsafe to perform this experiment in a live prison, that he needed some kind of control so he decided to use a portion of the school's campus to create a makeshift prison for his experiment. After receiving authorization from the university, he began making preparations for the experiment by transforming a dormitory that was vacant during the summer sessions into a makeshift prison. To attract participants for this program, he posted signs around the campus and ads in newspapers stating uh, the need for male college students for a psychological study of prison life. And he was offering $15 a day for each individual for up to two weeks. The, that would be the equivalent of about $115 a day in today's standards. Now, once the participants were selected and uh, uh, weeded out for those who actually had criminal uh, backgrounds, they began separating the participants into two profiles, prisoners and prison guards. The selection process for this was completely random. I, I don't remember if it was flipping a coin or drawing cards or whatever it was. It was a completely random process for deciding who was going to be a prisoner and who was going to be a prison guard. But what they told the participants is that they were uniquely uh, uh, selected for their role based on character markers in their psychological profile that indicated that they would more than likely end up either as a prison guard or as a prisoner. On August 14th of that year, they began the experiment. Let us pray. Heavenly Father, we ask that you come into this space today, that you, that you speak to us that uh, the words that you share with us today, that they move us the direction that you are calling us to be. How we receive these words is wholly dependent on your Holy Spirit, Lord. But above all, let us know your present and presence in this place. Let us feel your words affecting us. Lead us into a life that's filled with righteousness and your love. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, good morning, Caldwell Methodist. Everybody enjoy the weather last night? Yeah, I, I think it's ironic. Uh, I'm doing a study on the Holy Spirit. And uh, Wednesday, we, we learned this word ruah from Hebrew, which means wind, breath, spirit, and Holy Spirit. And uh, it, it's we were talking about how... It was that word that's used when it said the, the Red Sea was split 
through the breath of God, the wind of God. It felt like the wind of God last night. Amen. Well, we're going to get back to this this experiment in a little while, but for now, I, I imagine you're trying to figure out how in the world does that experiment connect with our scripture today about eating with sinners and tax collectors. Well, we're going to get there. And I think it's a good th- good idea to jump into our scripture and kind of get some foundation here, uh, do some groundwork to see where we're at. Well, in the beginning of chapter 9, Jesus ha- had just crossed this body of water, and he's getting out of his boat, and he's bombarded by a bunch of people that meet him there on the shore. And some of them bring this man, this paralyzed man, laying on a mat, and they bring him up to him. And scripture says that Jesus saw their faith and said to the man, take heart, your sins are forgiven. Isn't that wonderful? Isn't that just a beautiful story? I mean, think about it. The only thing that that man wanted, the one that was lying on the the, the the mat, the one that was carried by his friends, the paralyzed man, the only thing in the world that he wanted was for his sins to be forgiven. Right? Let's say you had an accident and, and you were paralyzed and, and you, went, you heard about this doctor that, that had the ability to give you the ability to walk back. And you went up to the, you scheduled an appointment with the doctor, you went to see the doctor and the doctor says, so glad you're here. Your sins are forgiven. Wouldn't that make all things better? How would you feel about that? Now, the church thing to say is, that's all I need is forgiveness, right? But let's be real. We're, we're human beings, aren't we? In a real situation, you would feel, well, others have come to you and received healing that have been miraculously healed by you, and you're offering me forgiveness? Doesn't sound right, right? Well, I believe Jesus knew what the guy wanted because later in the scripture, he heals him, right? And I believe that, that he meant to heal him and he was going to heal him. But Jesus was just about to call Matthew uh, into his fold of disciples. And this was an opportunity to set the stage to teach the Pharisees a lesson. Now, that sounds cold, doesn't it? When you when thinking about uh, uh, teaching the Pharisees a lesson, well, I don't think Jesus was doing it in the way of, like, they're doing bad, I'm going to teach them a lesson. I think he really wanted them to learn something about, about who he was. You know, I believe Jesus interacted with the Pharisees so much because it was his desire for them to learn, to learn and to know who Jesus is. I don't think that Jesus wished that they would suffer So I think that's why he had so many interactions with them. But Jesus tells this man that his sins are forgiven, and the Pharisees are right there, and they say, this man is blaspheming. They yell it at him, right? This man is blaspheming. What is it that Jesus said that caused him to blaspheme? That's a strange word, isn't it? Well, blasphemy, what it means is to speak irreverently about God or sacred things. In other words, it's about, it could be speaking incorrectly about God or speak, putting yourself in the place of God to speak for him when it's not right. What I mean by that is like, let's say that I said that God says that all cats are evil. That would be blasphemy, right? Especially to you cat lovers out there, right? Now, all cats are evil. Well, you know, God's never said that to me. And there's no scripture that I know of. Maybe, maybe you guys can help me with that. There's no scripture that I know of where God says that. For, so for me to say that on behalf of God is blasphemy. It's taking the sacred word of God and using it for my own benefit, right? Well, what did Jesus do that that they called him out on blasphemy. Well, he spoke on behalf of God saying that this man's sin was forgiven, right? There's no one that can forgive sin but God. And Jesus 
forgave this man's sin. This means that when Jesus was forgiving this man, when he was speaking, he was speaking as if he was indeed God. Now, let's interject one little belief that the, um, that the Jewish people held in these days. They also believed that illness and suffering was directly related to a person's sin. I'm going to say that again. Illness and suffering were directly related to a person's sin. Now, it may not be your sin specifically, but somebody in your, sin, in your family must have sinned for you to be in this situation. In other words, if you're sick, it means you must have sinned. If you're paralyzed, you must have sinned. You know, we, uh, we were doing the Fresh Air Bible study uh, on Wednesdays, and this past Wednesday in our first session, we talked about this guy named Job, right? And in Job's situation, if you haven't read his book, um, it, he loses first his, his wealth, and then he loses his children, uh, and then he loses his health. In fact, he has boils and stuff all over his body, right? And he's just suffering to the point where he's, he's scratching himself with a sharp edge just to get through it to, to try to get some, some uh, easement of his pain. And, and then when all of that happens, his wife tells him, why don't you just curse God and die? So he loses his wife's support. And then when, he, when he's at his, the end of his rope, when he's, he's got nothing left, he's got these three wonderful friends that come and visit him with this other guy. And they come and they sit down with Job and they pick at him. And they try to figure out what it is, what sin he has done to allow this to happen. And we know that he hasn't done anything, that it's just happened to him. But there must be some sin that he's done that's caused this to do that. Those are great friends, aren't they? I mean, if you're, you're suffering, maybe you had a car accident or something like that, and they come over and say, well, what did you do? Because that's exactly what you want to hear right then, right? Well, the next thing that Jesus does is he heals this man. And before he does, he asks the Pharisees, well, what is easier, forgiving this man's sin or healing him? And so he heals him. And it's immediately after this that our scripture comes in. It's immediately after this, Jesus gets up and he begins to leave. And as he's leaving, he looks and he sees Matthew sitting over in the, in the corner in a tax collector's booth. He's sitting there probably trying to stay out of the way, but listening to what's going on. And he looks over at Matthew and he says, follow me. You know, uh, I don't know if you've seen the, the Chosen uh, series yet, but they, they, they do a wonderful job showing how this, uh, how in my own mind's eye, how I see this happening. I, I, they, it shows Jesus says, follow me, and then Jesus walks away. He doesn't wait for him. He just says, follow me, and he walks away. I, I, it makes me think that maybe that happened more than once in Scripture. Now, we have, it's appropriate that this scene is in the gospel because it's when Matthew, who's the author of this book, is called to be a disciple. And we have several accounts of all the other disciples being called. However, the way he is called makes me wonder if he, if these 12 weren't just the only ones that were asked. If Jesus may have gone up to other people and said, follow me, and walked away, and they stayed behind. It makes me wonder that. Because obviously they wouldn't have made it into the book because they weren't disciples, right? It's a great thought, but and I, and I think that, uh, like sometimes that happens to us, God calls us for something and we miss that moment, don't we? We hear God calling us to do something and we walk away from that moment. But that really doesn't have anything to do with our message today. It may or may not, but uh, I thought that was interesting. So in this situation, Matthew jumps up out of his booth and he follows Jesus and then Jesus ends up eating at Matthew's house. His other disciples were also there as long as and other tax collectors see this rabbi willing to go eat at Matthew's house so they join him for dinner and some sinners, some outcasts in society, they see Matthew 
uh, in having Jesus as rabbi at their house. So they go over there. You know, I have to wonder if that was an uncomfortable dinner for the disciples. I mean, yeah, they're eating with Jesus, but really they're eating at the house of a tax collector, right? I mean, who wants to go to an IRS, IRS agent's house to eat, right? Who's going to invite one of them over, right? If you're an IRS agent, please don't audit me. <laughs> but the point is, we're obviously missing something, right? Because if there's a, a member of our church or, or, or somebody in the community that, that works for the IRS, we're not going to uh, completely ostracize them. We're not going to remove them from the uh, the community, right? We're going to welcome the church and into our lives. That's the job they do. So what is it that that they see about a tax collector that we don't see? Well, what they view a tax collector as is equivalent to what Jewish people in World War II Poland felt like when their friends and their neighbors were given batons and badges and were told to police the Jewish people to gather them up and to put them into ghettos. These friends and neighbors, these once trusted people of the community were now gathering them up out of their homes, sticking them into ghettos or even sending them with the Nazis away to be disappeared. The tax collectors were, of the first century were not working for the Jewish people. They were working for Rome this empire that had come in and taken them over. They would also take advantage of other people to earn a salary. And what, what the Romans would say is, you need to collect this amount for the taxes. And if you want to get paid, you need to take a little bit more for yourself for the service of taking. And I imagine when they began, they probably just took a little bit, right? But as people began to despise them for the work that they were doing, they began to take a little bit more. And then, they, and then their greed would come in, and all of a sudden they're taking a lot more because they had the right to do it. They took advantage of people. And as you can imagine, the, the people saw them as sellouts, as traitors, as thieves. They were no longer part of the family. They were excommunicated. And when the Pharisees see Jesus and his disciples eating a meal at Matthew's house, you can imagine how they would feel, how they would react to that, couldn't you? Now, the last time they called out Jesus and accused him directly, but this time they pull the disciples aside and they ask him, why does your teacher Eat with tax collectors and sinners. Why are you letting him do that? Let's pause on that word sinners for a moment because because like yeah, because we're all sinners, right? And and I think it's safe to assume that even the Pharisees knew that they had sinned, right? Because they do this thing called the Day of Atonement every year so they can atone for their sins. So they understand that they're sinners. But what they're talking about is this is this other class of people, the dredge of society, the prostitutes that are selling their bodies for money, the druggies that are that are stealing from people to to feed their habits so they can get high, the, the, the tax collectors that would steal from their fellow neighbors so that they can become rich, these people that were despised by society, they, these were the sinners. Sure, they, they told a lie every now and again, but they weren't these people. Perhaps today we would call them the canceled people. To the Jewish people those days, the idea of a sinner was more than just people that had sinned. It was people that actively worked for their own benefit at the expense of others. Or those who were marked by their sin, the sin of their lives, like an alcoholic, like a, like a thief, like a drug addict. Or in the eyes of the Jewish people, like a paralyzed man. Because obviously he must have been a sinner, right? The only reason he's suffering the way he is is because he must have done something. 
they asked the disciples why Jesus ate with tax collectors and sinners, and Jesus heard them. And he looks over them and he says this, he says, it's not the healthy that need a doctor, but the sick. It's not the healthy that need a doctor, but the sick. He says, but go and learn what this means. He he tells them to go and learn. He's like, look, go take some time for yourself and figure this out. He goes, I desire mercy, not sacrifice. I have come to call, not to call the righteous, but the sinners. Now, this was as much a lesson as it was a shot to the Pharisees because he's telling them that they were the ones that were supposed to be the doctors. They were the ones that were supposed to be doing the healing. I mean, when when you go to a doctor's office, right, and you show up, I mean, and and you say, hey, I'm sick. I got 103 fever. Fix me, right? And the doctor says, no, 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 no. You're sick. I treat well people. It doesn't make any sense, right? Well, this is what the Pharisees were doing. The only people that they were interacting with were the people that were going to church that had a relationship with God, the ones that were tithing, the ones that, they, that, that appreciated them. Those are the people that they were treating. And Jesus is saying, you see all these sick people out here. Those are the ones that you're supposed to be healing. He says, I've come. It's not the healthy that need a doctor, but the sick. I've come not to call the righteous, because if they've got righteousness, they don't need salvation. If they've got righteousness, they don't need me. If you're healed, you don't need a doctor. So they should be the ones that were showing mercy to these tax collectors. They should be the ones that were showing mercy to these sinners. These are broken people but they still have value. They still have worth. When Jesus, what Jesus was saying is that the, all their rituals, all the stuff that they do is nothing if they didn't have mercy for people. In the Sermon on the Mount, Jesus said, blessed are the merciful for they shall be shown mercy. How can they expect to receive mercy if they're not willing to give it? Are we just like the Pharisees? I mean, do we see people that we call sinners and pass judgment on them? You know, it's those people that don't fit in with us, right? It's those people. You know, I'm guilty of of this. I'm guilty of pulling up to a traffic light and seeing that person asking for money and doing all that I can not to make eye contact with them. I don't know if they're panhandling or if they're, they have a genuine need. It's not my, my job to judge them. But why do I act like they don't exist? I'm guilty of hearing people's terrible situations and saying things like, well, if they only worked harder. They wouldn't be in this situation if they only worked harder or if they, if they only stayed away from that stuff or if they, they only stayed away from those people. They, I see them and I feel like they're getting what they deserve. Is that right? Is that mercy? Where's our mercy? Where's my mercy? When I was planning this sermon... This week I was considering what made people become the people they are. What made these people become the people they are? What made Matthew a tax collector? What made the prostitute a prostitute? What made the drug addict a drug addict? What drives people to make these decisions? You know, my whole life, I've never once, not once, heard a kid say that when I grow up, I want to be a drug addict and live on the street. I've never heard a kid say that. So what is it that drives people to become this? Then I was reflecting on a movie my my son and I watched years ago called The Stanford Prison Experiment. This is the story that I began with. And if you remember, the participants were selected for their roles randomly, right? 
It was a flip of a coin. But they were told that they were uniquely selected based on their psychological profiles for, to be either be a prisoner or a prison guard. Well, the experiment began, and the, and the prison guards, they mock arrest these, these uh, prisoners, and they take them to the prison, this repurposed dormitory. In the first day, it was a lot of laughter and joking around and stuff like that. But then on the second day, things began to change. Those that were acting as prison guards began to really live into the role and, to, and began to cause the prisoners to do very hideous things. When the prisoners began to react to this treatment, the prison guards began to punish them. They began spraying them with uh, fire hydrants and they they would take their mattresses away and they would take their, their bathroom breaks away and then give them buckets instead. And only three days, after only three days, the prisoners had felt like they'd been in prison for months. Their grip on reality was gone. The study was supposed to last two weeks, but it ended on the sixth day. And all of the participants, whether they were prison guards or prisoners, had some kind of psychological trauma from the experiment. And and it's because of that experiment that safeguards have now been put into place for future psychological experimentation to ensure that nobody receives permanent damage like this. However, after reflecting on on the experiment, it made me wonder about these people we call sinners in our lives, these people that we... We push aside in our lives. You know, it's easy to judge them because they behave a certain way, that they are just evil people, that, that God needs to unleash his wrath on, that God needs to just wipe out of our society. It's easy to do that. That's an easy thing to consider. But I think, but is that being, but is that being compassionate to them? Is that what Jesus would do. Jesus said, I have not come to call the righteous, but the sinners. Not the healed, but the sick. I believe we are called to take, or not to take care of the righteous, but those outcasts in our society, those people that the world hates. We are called to to reach out to them, to those people that have ended up in a situation either by their own doing or by the work of others, we are called to them. It's our duty to help heal them from the sickness that is keeping them from an authentic relationship with Christ. You know, an interesting fact about this prison experiment, those individuals, especially the, the, the prison guards, they maintained the ability to choose who they wanted to be. They were told what their role was, but no other stimulation was given. They were given a situation, they were told what their role was, and they maintained the ability to choose who they wanted to be in that situation. But they allowed their environment to choose for them. Are we going to allow our environment to choose who we are called to be? Or are we going to allow Jesus to make that choice for us? Let us pray. Heavenly Father, forgive me. Forgive me for not seeing for refusing to see. Forgive me for walking past those people that you have called into my sight. Forgive me for judging. Forgive me for not reaching out. And God, give me the strength to be your presence in this world. That when I encounter people that the world may despise, 
that I might be able to extend your love to them. Help me to see them with your eyes. Help me to love them with your heart. Help me to embrace them with your arms. Help me to be the man that you have called me to be. God, raise up your church today. That we are compassionate, that we are bold, and that we step into the gap that separates us. Let us love like we've never loved before. Lord, guide us. Guide us from this place to where you are calling us to be. And we pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. And sing one last song here. To Jesus I surrender all to him I freely give. I will ever love and trust him in his presence daily. As we get ready to leave this place, remember how much God truly loves you. And as we look out into the world and we see those people that maybe have been forgotten, remember the value that God holds on them too. See them with God's eyes. Love them with God's heart. Go forth in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit.